Hello again. This is uh, session eight of our Stories of the Old Testament. In this session, we're going to talk about the uh, life and, and death of uh, Solomon. Solomon became king of Israel shortly after the death of David, and uh, this was uh, only because Bathsheba reminded David of his promise to uh, place Solomon on the throne at his death. Uh, his half-brother, Adonijah, was attempting at that point to seize the kingship for himself. But uh, with the anointing of Solomon and the placing him on the throne, uh, Solomon was immediately able to establish his rule. And the Bible passage uh, points out that David had reigned 40 years over Israel, 7 years in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his rule was firmly established. Now, it was truly firmly established. Um, at one point, Adonijah was executed. Uh, what he had done was request that one of David's concubines be given to him. Uh, he actually passed that request through Bathsheba to, uh, to Solomon. Solomon became furious and ordered the execution of Adonijah. The reason for that is that the individual who um, I guess inherited is the proper word, inherited the concubines of the leader who has uh, just died, was generally regarded as the appropriate successor. And with Adonijah asking uh, for, seemingly in an innocent way, asking for one of David's concubines, uh, it was a bit of an attempt, perhaps, to uh, reestablish his claim to the throne. Another individual that was uh, dealt with was Joab. Joab had been David's general for many years and, uh, incidentally, was his nephew. And uh, he had conspired with Adonijah. For that reason, David ordered his execution just before he died. And when uh, Solomon attempted to uh, carry out that act, um, uh, Joab was holding the horns of the altar in the tent of the Lord. Uh, theoretically, that would provide him with sanctuary, but because he wouldn't uh, wouldn't leave the uh, wouldn't leave the tent, uh, David went or uh, Solomon went ahead and had him executed anyway. Now, after he had, as the Bible states, firmly established his uh, reign, established his throne, uh, he was approached by God in a dream. Solomon was one of the uh, unique individuals, a handful of individuals in the Old Testament who spoke to God face to face, although this is uh, more of a dream than a, than a face to face uh, confrontation. And what the Bible says is that the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream and God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, give your servant a discerning heart to distinguish between right and wrong. Now, this obviously was a very pleasing answer to the Lord. In fact, the Bible says the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this, and he said, I will do what you asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Now, this is a, uh, uh, quite a promise, and this is the presentation of Solomon in Bible studies, uh, certainly in the Christian world. Uh, anymore, Solomon is regarded as one of the, uh, the wisest and the best of the, uh, of the kings. But uh, in reality, his life took an entirely different turn. Uh, he eventually deviated from his initial intentions as a king and became a, a true tyrant by the end of his life and a worshiper of pagan gods. Now, before we get to that aspect of it, I wanted to take some time to talk about the temple. The temple is foundational to the um, Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, the temple is where uh, many of the activities of uh, early Christianity developed, and it was Solomon who built the temple. So I thought we should take a few moments to uh, take a look at uh, what it looked like, how it was built, where it was built, and a little bit about the history of the temple. There are some uh, Bible passages that refer to it that are very important. Uh, this first one says, in the 480th year after the Israelites had come out of Egypt, in other words, the Exodus, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, he began to build the temple of the Lord. Uh, this has been dated essentially to uh, 966 B.C. Uh, certainly this is a, um, 
a, a date that could be modified one way or another. But uh, it goes on to tell us that in the 11th year of Solomon's reign, the temple was finished. It, and then it points out that he had spent seven years building the temple. Um, and this was uh, dated somewhere around 959 B.C., and then uh, it goes on to, <laughs> by contrast, it points out that Solomon took 13 years to construct his palace, which was uh, probably much bigger and uh, much more elegant than, than even the temple was. Now, David had prepared for the construction of the temple. He'd bought the materials, he hired the architects, uh, he hired the contractors, he uh, purchased the land, the uh, threshing field of Arana, but David was not permitted to build the temple. If we take a look at the map of Jerusalem here, we can see that at the time of David, uh, the field to the north, which is at the top of the screen, uh, was undeveloped, and that was a threshing field, but it was bought by David, and uh, it's referred to as the threshing field of Arana, and it was up there that the temple was built and uh, certainly many administrative buildings, and the wall of Jerusalem was extended to include the temple and uh, these new buildings. And of course, the purpose of the temple, right from the very start, had been for the placement of the Ark of the Covenant. We don't know what the Ark looks like. This is probably not an unrealistic uh, representation of it. It's about the size of a footlocker with the cherubim, the cherubim on top. And... Um, of course, in uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, it was much more elaborate, but uh, that's uh, something that we don't know from the Bible. We don't know what the uh, description was. Now, the temple itself was a uh, remarkable structure. It was built of, of stone and uh, large timbers. And if we take a look, uh, we can speculate about how it looked. We don't know what the final uh, surface decorations were, but we know the size of it and the shape. And uh, if we move on to these slides here, we can reconstruct the temple. We were told, for example, in the Bible, that it was 60 cubits on the long side, and um, it was uh, 30 cubits high and uh, 20 cubits wide. Let's see, there we go. We can bring up the 20 cubits wide. Now, the cubits are essentially a foot and a half, although the uh, cubits ranged anywhere from uh, 15 inches to about 21 inches, depending on the country and uh, the purpose for the cubit. So the temple was essentially 90 feet by uh, 45 feet high and perhaps 30 feet wide. The reason it's only 30 feet wide is that um, you have to make the roof structure no wider than the longest material that you can use to span the distance. And the largest material at that particular time were cedars of Lebanon, which were about 30 feet long. You could add additional rooms, but you would have to have pillars or additional support walls. And uh, so the reason that the temple is, is as narrow as it is for a, a magnificent structure uh, is simply because of the limitations of the building supplies that were available at that time. We are told that there was a door placed in the uh, narrow end of the, uh, of the temple, and then two pillars were placed outside. They were given names. And then there was a portico of some sort, which may have covered the pillars, or perhaps uh, the pillars were outside the portico. But the most important part of the temple is that we are told there was an inner room, the Holy of Holies, and this Holy of Holies was to be the residing place of the Ark of the Covenant, and as a result, it would be the literal throne room of the Lord. And we are told that this is 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits. In other words, 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. Now, it's the width of the temple, but it's not the height of the temple. And the question is, what happened to those additional 10 cubits, and why were they not included? There is a, uh, a very good theory about this. Um, it's been raised by a, a scholar named Dr. Lane Rittmeyer. He is perhaps uh, the, the authority on uh, the Temple Mount and the reconstruction of the original temple. And it is his theory that the Holy of Holies was placed upon the highest point on Mount Moriah, and it would have been at the highest point in the temple. 
this is certainly the tradition of people in that part of the world. They would place their sacred places, their sacred temples and their high places at the highest point of land uh, surrounding, uh, surrounding the city or the region where they lived. And uh, so if the Holy of Holies, if that 20 cubit room, that 20 cubit uh, uh, cube, which was the Holy of Holies, was placed at the highest point, it would play out something like this. We would have the highest point on the, um, the, at uh, the field of Arana, and the Holy of Holies would be placed on top of that. Now, the ground would fall away from the highest point, and so the temple, the, the remainder of the temple, would be at a lower level, and it is speculated that there was either a ramp or a, um, a staircase that led up to the Holy of Holies as opposed to a flat floor in which he walked straight into it. Now, we don't know what the temple looked like, but uh, there are uh, numerous uh, theories about it based upon what other ancient buildings look like. Here is a uh, picture of uh, a speculation of what the temple might have looked like. It has the, uh, the lateral rooms built off to the side. It has some clear story windows, uh, the pillars out in front. Uh, we don't know what it looked like, but uh, this, um, this co isn't too far-fetched, in my opinion. One thing we are told, though, is that it was quite elegant inside. Uh, everything, all of the uh, various accoutrements, the, the tables and the, and the furnishings inside were gold-covered, but we are also told this, uh, which is um, a, a remarkable a uh, remarkable statement. It says that Solomon overlaid the whole interior with gold. He also covered the floors of both the inner and outer rooms of the temple with gold. In other words, uh, gold foil, hammered gold foil, was used to overlay the entire surfaces uh, of, of the entire inside of the temple. It would have been uh, an astonishing thing for people to see and um, uh, a, it was done primarily as a dedication to the Lord. Now the temple, uh, under the, the temple was built of stone and uh, timber, and as a result, it was um, uh, subject to deterioration, especially when it wasn't um, when it wasn't maintained properly. And as we are going to see on our our next couple of sessions, when we talk about the uh, division of the kingdom and the introduction of pagan worship into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, uh, there were long periods of time where the faith of Yahweh. Uh, was not observed by the Israelites, and the temple was either neglected or abused, and it would deteriorate. Uh, there are several uh, cycles in which an individual, for example, uh, Hezekiah, and uh, also by Josiah late in the 600s, uh, where attempts were made to restore the temple, uh, re return it to its uh, state of elegance, and there were uh, periods of revival, religious revival, but then uh, the people would fall away again. And by the time of Josiah, the temple had been in a terrible state of disrepair. Uh, he made attempts to uh, rebuild it, or at least to restore it to some degree, but it was destroyed just a few years later by the Babylonians. We'll talk about that in our, uh, in our uh, 11th session. Uh, there was a restoration of the temple after the Babylonian exile when the, uh, many of the uh, descendants of the original exiles returned to Jerusalem during the time of uh, Cyrus and, and Darius the king. Uh, the temple was uh, rebuilt to uh, some degree, uh, nothing uh, to uh, match its original splendor, but it was rededicated in 516 B.C., and then there was another uh, period of, of uh, deterioration and abuse, especially during the time of the Seleucids. Uh, the temple was restored once again during the time of the first Hanukkah. Uh, this was dated to about 164 B.C. And then this original small temple was enlarged dramatically, uh, beginning sometime around 18 B.C. by Herod the Great. And this enlargement took uh, 40 years or, or more. It, it, it extended far beyond the, uh, uh, the time of Herod himself, but he enlarged the platform upon which the temple was built and made a magnificent structure, which, uh, in my opinion, should, have, should be regarded as one of the uh, wonders of the ancient world. Here's a reconstruction of that temple, 
And uh, you can see that what he had done is create a huge temple around the original one. Uh, it was enclosed with a uh, wall into which, uh, it, through which only the priests could enter. And then the entire platform was almost doubled in size uh, with the walls that we see yet today. Um, the outer courtyards were areas where Gentiles were allowed to, um, to congregate, and the colonnades around the outside were places for uh, such people as the money changers. Uh, we have the royal stoa here, which is a uh, huge structure built in which the uh, Sanhedrin, and, and there, there would be various meetings of religious leaders in that uh, very Hellenistic-looking structure that Herod built. And uh, finally, at the north end, uh, overlooking, in fact, even incorporated into the wall of the temple, uh, was the Antonia Fortress, which the Romans had built so that they could keep an eye on the, um, uh, the activities that were taking place inside. Um, the Jewish population was not very friendly towards the Romans, and there were numerous outbreaks of, of riots and uh, rebellion, and the Romans wanted to keep a close eye on the area where perhaps many of these revolts and rebellions were plotted. Now, this magnificent temple, uh, the Temple Mount, was totally destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. This was just uh, a generation after it was completed, and uh, it was um, uh, leveled to the ground, eventually to, replaced, to be replaced by the, uh, the gold dome structure uh, known as the Dome of the Rock that is on the Temple Mount today. Um, let's talk about one other important connection to the time of Solomon that deals with construction and uh, some type of confirmation of the uh, description of activities in the Bible. We are told that Solomon fortified the cities of Hatzor, Megiddo, and Gezer. This is kind of an interesting comment because uh, he, he was involved in lots of construction uh, he was refortifying and repairing lots of his cities, but these three specifically were mentioned, and uh, his reign is dated to sometime in the middle of the 900s B.C. The point being here that uh, Hatzor, Megiddo, and Gezer have been excavated, and they each have a somewhat identical gate system that was put in. It was unique to the middle of the 900s, and uh, they... Uh, are all designed somewhat the same, which would suggest that these were indeed three special cities that were enlarged and fortified in a way that was uh, done during the time of Solomon, as described in the Bible. If we look at the uh, Bible text here, we see that uh, the Bible says, here is the account of the forced labor King Solomon conscripted to build the Lord's temple, his own palace, the supporting terraces, the Wall of Jerusalem, and it goes on to point out Hatzor, Megiddo, and Gezer. Now, the question is, why would they specifically identify these three cities? And the answer, again, can be found if we look at a map. Let's take a look at a map of Israel again. Jerusalem was located in the Judean hills, and it was difficult to get from the coastal plain up to Jerusalem, except by uh, two specific routes. One of these joined the major trade route that traveled uh, from the south to the north along the coast, uh, crossing, crossing the rift up by uh, the Sea of Galilee, and there was this road that led down to Jerusalem. The approach to that road was guarded by several cities. Now, Hatzor was uh, one of the cities that was mentioned. Uh, Hatzor was a major city that guarded the north end of the approaches into Israel. Megiddo was the city that controlled the pass that led through the Judean hills and was quite strategic. Numerous battles were fought at Megiddo. and In fact, it is the Har Megiddo, the, the hill of Megiddo, that is mentioned in the book of Revelation as Armageddon. It comes through into the Greek as Armageddon. And finally, the city of Gezer was located at the approach to Jerusalem. And so these were three very strategic cities, and reconstruction of the gates that were done there uh, shows that a very complex gate system was uh, apparently designed. It was newly used with those three cities, and archaeology has agreed that these um, gates were built sometime in the middle 900s, 
which would be during the time of the reign of Solomon. Now let's move on to the last years of, si uh, of Solomon. Uh, the question is this, how did he build all these things? And the answer is quite simple, he was a tyrant. Um, Bible studies tend to ignore this, they, they like to look uh, uh, to Solomon as one of the wisest and, and the best of the kings, but in reality he was far from that. If we look at the Bible text, uh, there are several, I'm going to show you several passages here. This one says, here's the account of the forced labor that Solomon conscripted to build. In other words, uh, he was uh, drafting people into work gangs and forcing them to uh, be involved in his construction. Another passage points out that all the people left from, and it lists those people, but uh, as, a, as, a, as a group, they were the uh, Canaanites that were attacked by the Israelites. And it points out that all those people left from those groups who the Israelites could not exterminate, these Solomon conscripted for his slave labor force, and it refers to it as a slave labor force, as it is to this day. Now, of course, that meant during the writing of that particular passage. Now, one additional uh, unpleasant uh, uh, depiction of Solomon comes towards the end of his life when it points out that he fell away from his faith. He had hundreds of pagan wives, and he began to worship pagan gods. This was expressly forbidden and uh, was something that was eventually uh, forbidden entirely with the, uh, with the uh, renewal of the faith by Ezra uh, a couple of hundred years later. But uh, the Bible says this. It says that Solomon had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. <laughs> This is uh, uh, certainly uh, similar to what we read about in the book of Genesis when uh, Adam complained that uh, it wasn't his fault that he ate the apple, that, uh, uh, that the woman uh, led him astray, and that uh, Eve, Eve was at fault there. But it points out that as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his hearts to other gods. Now, these wives were primarily political wives from uh, surrounding, uh, surrounding warlords and and uh, leaders of other countries, but these wives and concubines were all pagans. It allowed Solomon to uh, perhaps um, deviate from his faith. He, it, it points out here that he followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Malach, the detestable god of the Ammonites, gods to whom babies were sacrificed. Uh, this is a terrible thing, and it points out that Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and as a result, uh, Israel would be severely punished because of the, uh, the failures of Solomon. Uh, this became a bit of a, um, a feature in religious art, uh, this particular one, uh, which was uh, done by Preti in 1675, shows <laughs> Solomon wearing his Bedouin garb and his women in their Bedouin garb, uh, burning incense to pagan gods. Um, I put it, it's, it's, it's kind of amusing, but uh, it gives you a sense of what the elderly Solomon may have been involved in. And then the Bible goes on to say that uh, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And uh, then it uh, finishes up with uh, Solomon saying that he reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years, and then he rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. We can fix the death of Solomon almost precisely to 930 B.C. This is a very, very important uh, date because it is the earliest date that we can uh, agree on as being perhaps historically accurate. Everything prior to the time of Solomon is based upon some type of interpretation of the numbers that are in the Bible. And there are those that argue that these numbers are literal. In other words, 40 years is 40 years, 480 years is 480. Uh, there are many scholars, however, who will point out that Many of the numbers in the Bible are symbolic, certainly in the book of Revelation, 
and that every number has to be examined as to whether it is real or symbolic. And as a result, we have numerous dates for the Exodus. We have numerous dates for the time of uh, the destruction of Sodom. We have numerous dates for the uh, uh, life, the birth and the life of Abraham. And uh, these are all speculative and uh, are, are open to constant debate. With the death of Solomon, the so-called, uh, what, what you might refer to as the golden years of Israel came to a close. The uh, United Kingdom of Saul, David, and Solomon had lasted only a hundred years. And in the next session, we're going to examine what happened to the kingdom of Israel upon the death of Solomon. Uh, it fell apart, was divided into uh, two smaller kingdoms, Judah and one that retained the name of Israel. Uh, they fell into pagan worship, and uh, with the rise of external powers such as Assyria, uh, the Arameans, and uh, the numerous small kingdoms of Moab, uh, Edom, uh, the Ammonites, uh, Israel and Judah um, deteriorated and uh, were gobbled up by the uh, superpowers uh, at the north of Assyria and eventually uh, by Babylon. So we'll be talking about that in our next session. I hope you'll join us. Bible Interact is a group of Bible scholars and biblical archaeologists who promote the Hebraic nature of Scripture and view the two Testaments as one unified message. They explain how they use a first century approach to searching the Scriptures, and they share their methods and discoveries for discussion and dialogue. They invite your comments and participation on BibleInteract.tv, where you can also find more teachings, self-study quizzes, webinars, and interviews.